cool. We are loading, so just give it a couple of seconds so it doesn't buffer. And then I will send a YouTube link in the chat where you can also enable closed captions. So these closed captions will be enabled to watch, uh, see on Otter and also YouTube. So I'm gonna show the YouTube right here so I can turn on closed captions and cool. Yeah, all right, welcome everyone to our collab event with ADP List with Design Buddies for design, designing with accessibility in mind with some accessibility experts here with us today. I'm Grace, I founded Design Buddies in April and I kind of seen it kind of go viral and um, Design Buddies, if you don't know what Design Buddies is, we're the world's largest design community. We're partnered with Amazing Design People List. We have a lot of fun events like this, a lot of design resources, all for free, um, and a lot of fun, good stuff. And I'm wearing our Design Buddies shirt here with our birthday merch. And so we have merch as well. Just We have a nice, cute buffalo mascot, and we're just really a design community to help anyone interested in design. We have a lot of events like this. And full-time, I'm a product designer at Electronic Arts. And we're so excited to have ADP List. So Sierra, do you want to introduce ADP List? Yeah, hi everyone. I am Sierra. I'm a community engagement specialist at ADP List. Super excited to be here today with Design Buddies. So ADP List is a global community based on genuine connection. It's a platform where people can find, book, and meet mentors around the world. Our mission is to foster an inclusive space and support network for designers to come together, learn from each other, and strive to be better. So if you haven't had a chance to give us a try, feel free to head over to adplist.org. The link will be uh, added to the chat. Um, and just let me know if you have any questions. Awesome, thank you. And for the this event, um, we for those of you joining, we do have closed caption available on Otter and on YouTube. So I can drop the link again. Um, the link will be dropped again during the chat where you can access closed caption. Unfortunately, I wasn't able, Zoom didn't have that feature for us. So we use Zoom and Otter if you want that options available. And this, the format of the event will be basically like a coffee shop chat with an audience. So if you all have any questions for our speakers here today, definitely raise your hand or put your questions on Slido and upload each other. So you have two options to raise your hand, come on stage, camera on or camera off, um, or put them on Slido if you don't wish to be on stage with us. And we also have some some prefab questions that we've gathered from your RSVPs on Luma. And during this event, um, please refrain from sharing your link. Grace, you've just gone on mute, love. Oh, where did I leave off? You said, please refrain from. Oh, yes. <laughs> Please refrain from sharing your LinkedIn's in the chat. Um, we have a networking sheet where you can share them all and connect with all of your buddies and share anything you want down there. Um, and towards the end as well, we will have a group photo. So at 5.58, two minutes before, a group photo and a um, story for Instagram where we wave together. And yeah, let's get started with intro. So for our speakers, we can go in alphabetical order. Um, so introductions, one or two minutes, like what are you doing now and how did you get into design and why did you choose accessibility? Anna? Oh, okay. sorry, I was trying to figure out which alpha, which part of the alphabet we were going by, first name or last name, um, sorry. Hi, uh, my name is Anna E. Cook. I use the pronouns she, her, or they, them. Uh, I'm a senior accessibility designer at Northwestern Mutual. And I've been, uh, I, I've converted as it were from a product designer to an accessibility designer. Um, in the past nine years since starting my career, I've watched accessibility really become a huge part of our community, um, but, the amazing thing is that accessibility has existed and has been growing since a very long time ago. The Americans with Disabilities Act is 31 years old this June, and that's a really big deal, especially for us in America, but I know we're global. Uh, so there's, there's more than that, and there's a lot of impact that we get to make. And so uh, I started this path when I started my design career, and I was lucky to have that opportunity. Um, I know not everyone gets that. So thank you for coming and for growing with us. Awesome, thank you. Bronwyn? 
Yeah, so um, I'm a senior product designer at Xero, um, specifically within their design systems team. Um, I followed the very traditional path of design. I graduate, well, I graduated from university studying design, graphic arts in particular, and have gone through a kind of the branding background all the way through to digital to now being a product designer. Um, being part of the design systems team, we have a huge focus on accessibility but my accessibility journey started a little bit earlier than that maybe sort of two or three years ago um, and I was working with a university and their need was to meet AAA and that to me just got me stuck in the world of kind of these amazing guidelines and the need for it and now I just see the need for it everywhere I see the need for it in my very very poor eyesight in my dyslexic husband in my granddad who's 101 and feels slightly excluded from um, industry because he doesn't really use technology or from society even because he doesn't use technology. Um, so for me it's been just a kind of an obvious thing to pick up and um, just feels right and so I've become a bit of an advocate for it because um, I want every other designer to kind of feel the, the need to, to embark on this journey as well. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. Trey? Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Trey Banks. Uh, I'm a staff UX designer at the Home Depot. And um, I think for me, the, the driver that got me really focused and centralized in design was really about understanding how because uh, I wasn't into being a designer per se. I didn't really understand the, it in its in its root. But when it came to solving problems, I think that's really where I, I kind of perked up a little bit. and started to do a little bit of research and dug in and uh, uh, it's history from there. Uh, but it's, oh man, it's, it's been a while. So I guess for me, I think the driver for accessibility is, uh, I, I remember one day uh, we had a, uh, a team meeting and went into this meeting and one of our uh, leaders of accessibility at the time who was no longer at the Home Depot, but still an accessibility advocate and leader across the spaces of uh, where she currently is, she gave a speech and she talked specifically about how uh, the statistics show that everybody at some degree has a disability to some to some impact right whether it's temporary or whether it's permanent uh, or whether it's situational and i don't know something spoke to me about it and i thought about myself in, in different circumstances and to a lesser degree i think about some of the times that i find myself in very unique and vicarious states where i may need an extended hand and that just I don't know I just thought about that and just kind of drove me into this into this focus and I've been passionate about it ever since. Awesome thank you. Trace? Hey everyone um, I'm Trace Marinus. I am a senior product designer at OpenTable um, and my my sort of path to accessibility came from the fact that I'm severely dyslexic and so I have a really hard time reading, writing, spelling, doing a lot of things that we're required to do on the internet. Uh, and so it was kind of an obvious um, interest of mine as soon as I got into product design. It was something I always wanted uh, to focus on. Awesome, thank you everyone for sharing. Very different backgrounds. Really, and really looking forward to hearing what all of y'all have to say. And for those of you joining in, we are also live streaming on YouTube where you can enable closed captions and also on Otter. Um, and if you want to ask our speaker any questions, definitely raise your hand. Or if you don't want to speak up um, on stage, then you can ask us on Slido and upvote each other's. And so we'll also be taking some questions that got submitted from all of you, you all um, through Luma. So our first question is, when it comes to accessibility, what are some of the common pitfalls you see in designs? And can you provide some real world examples of these pitfalls and how to fix them? And we can go in reverse alphabetical order if that's okay. Trace? Sure, I'm um, happy to start. Uh, I think I was thinking about this question earlier today. I think some like a common mistake I see uh, is design teams uh, choosing something that's maybe more visually pleasing, but is less accessible. So for instance, you know, uh, the most accessible design might not necessarily uh, use color the way you want to, or might not use typography the exact way that we learned in a type class in college or something. Um, so I think, uh, 
I, I talk to my team a lot about making sure that we're vetting designs, not only for sort of design quality, but how accessible they are and how useful they are as well. Yeah, I also see that pitfall where my, my myself always go for the one that looks nicer, but it's always not always the most usable for the users. Trey? Yeah, that's, right. that's a great point. Um, both great points. Um, for me, I think this the, the, the solid piece of how is it all going to be laid out is a term like the marathon versus the sprint. Um, you're, you're constantly having to to evangelize this and and much of where I see the gaps uh, in our in our space from an enterprise perspective and beyond is that the prioritization is really not there um, and when you think about it you know how do you drive a team to think cross-functionally and cross-discipline to be more uh, centered around being an advocate for uh, being uh, driving accessible and inclusive uh, you know approaches and, and, and considerations of the design so um, just to what Trace was saying, like it's 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 something that we see, like found, it's foundational more or less, right? And then sometimes the the aesthetically pleasing drives the focus, but you're not looking at trying to prioritize and lead in with the consideration of how people are going to need to use this product uh, across the uh, across every different um, um, use case. Yeah, definitely. Always consider accessibility. Um, got some really in oh. Let's go with Bronwyn. Yeah, um, I think mine comes to actually when we think about starting to implement accessibility and I think it comes to the WCAG guidelines um, and it kind of is a trick in the name, which is we often start implementing accessibility almost as a checklist. Um, and as a result, we can often forget actually about the usability side of things. Um, we kind of go, oh, done, 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 done. And then suddenly, actually, the site's completely unusable, but actually it passes all the accessibility needs. Um, so something that kind of you talked about as well, like some of those things that you could potentially over use to overcome, one of those things... Um, I actually talked about it with um, one of my accessibility leads is that accessibility usable um, usability scale or the accessible usability scale. Um, Fable have a great example and Microsoft have a great example of that. And it just makes sure that you bring that usability lens to all your designs as you're implementing accessibility and, and really not forgetting about that side of things. Yeah, definitely. I feel like I've always seen people see like a checklist, but it's always usability is so important to consider as well, because ultimately people have to use the products, not just like checklist. Um, Anna? Yeah, I think, you know, the biggest problem I see and have seen is the assumption that uh, accessibility is a developer issue where so many accessibility considerations actually fit into our job. And they fit into other jobs too, you know, product owners, product managers. There's, there's a huge, you know, it doesn't start or stop with any one group of individuals contributing. And so, you know, our, our job is not to pass the buck as it were, but to, to look at our work and think about the ways that we're communicating um, the accessibility needs that we need to be communicating instead of assuming that, you know, let's say that our developers are already going to build this flow with a proper, proper focus order, let's say for like a modal opening or something like that. So really digging into what opportunities our designs have to do better and facilitating better communication between design and development and across the board. That doesn't mean you have to be a developer, it just means you've got to understand how to, to communicate. Yeah, I agree. Definitely not always like developer's job. I feel like user researchers, PMs, designers, all the people working on a product should consider accessibility. Um, and for those of you joining, you can view our YouTube for closed captioning. Um, unfortunately, it's not available on our Zoom. But and also, if you wish to ask the speakers any questions, definitely ask on Slido or you can raise your hand if you wish. And we're still going to take a question from Slido, which is number one, um, upvoted. And I'm going to post it in the chat as well. So if y'all have access to it, 
when designing for accessibility, how do you prioritize or quote unquote prioritize who to design for? Should you focus first on the deaf, blind, cognitive disability or other? And we can go in any order you want. If there's an awkward silence or no one's gonna talk, then I'm gonna randomly call on people, so. I'll do it. I'm excited to answer this one because, um, well, I'm excited to answer every single one, but um, I'll go first this time. So the amazing thing about accessibility is that many of the things that we do to meet the needs of one group of people meet the needs of other groups of people at the same time. And so when you're looking at, say, the world, or sorry, web content accessibility guidelines, and you're thinking like, oh, alt text is only for users who are blind and using screen readers, well, they might be the main user group that's benefiting from that, but there's also low bandwidth users that are benefiting that from that. And there's other places where broader inclusion is being applied to multiple groups of people. So I would say you don't have to pick just one. Um, that would be my, my short answer. Yeah, I love that. By designing for accessibility, you make the lives easier for all the users using your product. Anyone want to add anything else? Yeah, I'd love to. I love to hop in too. Um, plus one to everything Anna said. I think like it's one easy way to like sell accessibility to a product team or an engineering team is saying that like this will have impacts across all sorts of people and all sorts of um, parts of our business. It's you know the more that you do it, the better your product is going to be in general. Um, I think. The other thing you can consider is the type of service you provide, the type of product you provide, um, you know, depending on if you're a consumer platform or maybe a B2B platform, um, you might have different considerations. If you're a service that maybe has like real world touch points, there's even more to consider. Um, if you're just a software service, there's things to consider. So I think as long as you know your users really well, um, you'll be able to make really informed decisions. Uh, one thing that happened at OpenTable recently that I, I wasn't a part of, but uh, you know, OpenTable lets you make restaurant reservations and we didn't have any way for restaurants to show um, what they offer as far, in, as far as accessibility, like in their physical spaces. And so adding that in, um, didn't necessarily help one type of um, person with a disability, but it helped uh, our restaurants show consumers what they're doing to help all sorts of different people. So I think that was a small um, feature addition that helped, you know, kind of helped go across this, uh, this type of uh, question. Yeah, definitely. Bronwyn, I saw you on mute. Did you want to add something? Um, Charlie covered most of it, but I think one of the other things as well is potentially just um, how far you're along and, you know, how much buy-in potentially you have from an accessibility point of view. Um, and I never want to encourage quick wins for the default kind of, or the default of it, but potentially there might be a bit of a decision around kind of um, what are some accessibility, accessibility implementations that you can put in place quickly to show the benefits of it to then be able to maybe create a use case for then implementing accessibility, more accessibility further down the line. So that might be an approach. I think, you know, always default to potentially Anna and Trey, their responses first, and that would be, you know, ideal. Um, but if you need to, potentially thinking about it from that aspect might help. Yeah, awesome. Trey, did you also want to add anything? Really, there's nothing to add. I think that that's just uh, that's gold right there, to be honest with you. Um, but, you know, to, to, to look at it, it is very true that it's not important about it's not important where you're trying to start or the, the focus, because when you realize, when you look at the WCAG standards, all 61 testable criteria, you look at the baseline of how can you consistently service across the entirety of an experience? And how do you create an end-to-end -end experience that advocates for the user that's going to be utilizing? So when you do that proper, uh, just to Anna's point, when you do choose one, you really are advocating for others as well. So there's really nothing else to add. Yeah. 
And John also said in the chat, I would like to add that retrofitting and accessibility after a product has shipped, going back, making it accessibility later is unfair and less effects and more, ex and ex more expensive and never completed. So this is so important to make sure all your cross-functional partners and everyone working on a product considers accessibility from the beginning. Um, I'm gonna take a question from Slido as well. It comes from Ria. It says, hi, I'm a graphic designer. What are some things designers should keep in mind when working with brand guidelines to ensure that the company's branding is accessible? I can go with that. Um, so it's it's a unique. I know that in my experience, uh, I have a very uh, focus, a deep focus around enterprise software. Um, but I even look at it when it comes down to consumer uh, consumer facing products as well. Uh, I know a lot of the consumer facing products tend to be a lot more strict with their brand guidelines. Uh, a lot of internally facing things have a tendency to have more flexibility. But I would always say this. Uh, try to drive as much as you can with your product partners and all your stakeholders ac accordingly, because as you continue to build revisionist history behind different ways to drive more higher contrast ratios or, you know, uh, more consistency around um, how you're going to run with typeface or how you're going to run with your fonts and making sure everything is very easily readable. Uh, making sure that you're advocating for that and keeping a very solid revisionist history of all of those things so that you can continue to um, continue to provide or promote more opportunities uh, to just bring adjustments and subtle changes and subtle nuances inside of the design. Uh, now, if it's customer facing, a lot of the times these are more strict. I know Home Depot doesn't just let you change the orange. But the, the thing is, is that, you know, when you think about it, there are those battles and you would think, well, there's an, it's, it's a loss. It's not. You really do have the opportunity. You just have to kind of continue to understand that it's it's a marathon and not a sprint. It's unfortunate. I, I wish there was an easier answer to it, but that's one of the things I know that I've, I've dealt with. And we've had some wins from it as well. Awesome. Yeah, definitely subtle changes with the branding. And, um, and we got a lot of questions, 20 questions so far. Um, we're about 20 minutes in. So if no one wants to add anything else, I'll like pause for a few seconds and I don't see any answer. We're going to move on to the next question so I can try to cover as many questions as we can. All right, I'm going to move on to our next question. Um, Anonymous asks, do you have any advice on how to talk about the benefits of accessibility to product managers, stakeholders, so we can implement an accessible design? There's something about like, like talking about the business impact, um, I feel like that helps, but I was wondering if you all have anything else to add to this and how to just to create buy-in um, amongst like PM or like the leadership side of your company to, to consider accessibility and really take that in to factor in the product. Um, I can, I guess I can go. Uh, I definitely have, <laughs> I have a lot to say about this with a lot of enterprise impacts uh, for us. Much of what I've heard is, well, how many people have disabilities that use our software in the HR space? How many people have disabilities using our software and supply chain, et cetera, et cetera? And I, I've heard this time and time again. And I would say the number one thing that you don't want to do, so I think it might be stronger to not fight the we're going to get sued battle. Um, a lot of companies have the tendency to believe that they can go ahead and take on uh, and allocate money specifically for those uh, those those times that they're going to be sued. So one of the things that I would try to do is to understand the discipline and the and the approach around strong design practices as they're advocating for accessibility. And I believe it's kind of like a way of retrofitting it, if you will, um, uh, taking the opportunity to see what really solid and good design is, is not taking just black and white screens and assuming that you're going to have high contrast ratios and taking away a lot of the design elements, it's really about simplifying and understanding the different pieces to the puzzle that are going to create strong design practices as you're going in with your product partners. Before you realize it, um, you will start to get more buy-in because of the approaches that you're taking as a designer. To Anna's point, um, she was saying that it's not just on the engineers, right? It's, it's, we have an opportunity and we have a lot of responsibility here. Uh, as designers to make sure that we're advocating uh, for accessibility. So as you continue to get more out of the business or as you continue to get more out of uh, your stakeholders, uh, when you think that they're saying no, 
once you continue to put more design practices into those things, you'll realize, oh, the buy-in actually will start. But it, it is a long ride. It is not something you get instantly. It comes with trust and it comes with time and patience. Awesome, thank you. I like the, you won't get, let's, let's avoid getting sued. That's always a great reason as well to like really create buy-in um, and having everyone involved in the process. Anyone else? Um, I'll go ahead. Um, uh, I think I, I, you know, legislation changes and legislation varies. Uh, the short answer when it comes to, you know, are we legally obligated to be accessible is generally yes. And, um, but of course, companies will ask like, well, who in our space has been sued and how much are we going to have to pay? And then you start to go, well, I'm not a lawyer. Um, and that's, you know, how do I give an answer like that? And, and you can, you know, um, and some folks do. But at the end of the day, I have found the most compelling cases around advocating for accessibility lie in understanding that accessibility is, is not designing for an edge case. It is designing for core usability, core functionality. It is, there are, yeah, God, 25% uh, of the American population, 15% of the global population has been reported to have a disability. And the emphasis is on reported. How much of that data are we not getting yet? And how much are we perceiving disability as, um, as medical disability versus disability of, of life and circumstance. And so the thing I emphasize the most is that accessibility is a human right. And that every time we create an NBP without accessibility, we exclude people, we create systemic bias, we create injustice. And so in the world that we live in right now, we've seen how in the past 10 years in particular, how much that's damaged communities. So it's our job, especially as up and coming designers to, to advocate and push, even if we don't have the answers. And so I would say, you know, pour your heart out, take breaks and know as, um, you know, as Trey had said, it is a marathon. Every little win is gonna matter. Um, so it, it, yeah, I know that's intense, but that's that's usually what means the most to people. Yeah, to to add to that, I think um, when you start talking from like a point of empathy with your like bi business, more business minded uh, coworkers who maybe aren't always thinking about a user or a person, I think it really changes their perspective. Cause I know I talk to a lot of people who are very focused on numbers and all they think about all day is numbers and they're not thinking about people. Um, and it's not their job to think about people. So I think as designers, it is our job to talk about people and what they're experiencing. And I think that typically makes a really good case um, for, for, for putting in a little extra work. And, and Trey, so just to build on that, I think um, one of the things we need to be aware of is that we've actually, the numbers is biased and the data is biased out there. Um, and the fact is, is, you know, if we're trying to um, implement accessibility and we need to put evidence forward or we need to put a use case forward, a lot of the time we don't have the data available to us because we simply haven't tested for it. We simply haven't gone out and collected it. And so it's often very hard. So sometimes it's just about educating that actually the data that we do have is biased towards able-bodied or power users because that's been all we've collected to date. Um, and so actually, if we started to test with a more diverse user group, we'd actually come up with a lot more innovative, diverse solutions that meet the need of you know, a huge population. Yeah, I agree. Definitely a lot of truth bombs dropped here. Like, I feel like by by considering accessibility, you're helping with reducing like discrimination, biases among different populations as well, which is super, super important. So I feel like there's a huge like ethical implica implication and for the betterment of humanity to really consider accessibility because the data that the company has is always geared towards like people without disabilities. And so that's why it's super, super important to advocate for the 25% Americans with disabilities. 
Um, there's a lot of great questions. Um, just a reminder, please keep your questions on Slido, but if you wish to raise your hand, come up on stage, definitely do so on the hand raising. Zoom kind of changed the UI, so to raise your hand, just tap on reactions with a smiley face and raise your hand. And you can also watch on YouTube if you missed any part of this and um, access our closed captions as well. So we're gonna be taking a mix of questions submitted live on Slido. We have 26 questions so far, and also the ones that you all submitted um, while signing up on Luma. And so I've seen some discussion in the chat as well, but the top rated question right now is from Anonymous. I've seen a recent trend to make design accessible with people with mental health problems, for example, anxiety. Have any of you all designed for that in mind? And how would you design for people with um, mental health problems in general? I go, I, I think go. mental health, oh, oh no, go on. You're right, Trey. <laughs> go ahead, please. Go ahead. Um, I, <laughs> I think um, mental health just comes to me um, and talks to me about the neurodiversity um, and that's, you know, cognitive disabilities. And often because it's a stigma, people don't really like talking about it. Um, I think we just have to be careful of our language um, and think about easy English and um, a lot of those um, sort of practices. Um, I wasn't going to give too many tips on design because I haven't actually implemented too many neurodiversity um, design elements into my own design. But what I did want to bring up was um, there was this incredible um, podcast that got shared with me a little while ago, which is, Are You Embracing Neurodiversities with Dr. Nancy Doyle? Um, and she talks about neurodiversity more so in the workplace, but I reckon there's a lot of translatable things there that we can bring into design. But the reason Dr. Uh, Dr. Nancy Doyle is super interesting is that she also is a founder of um, Genius Within, .co.uk. Um, there is a link I'm sure we can share, um, which really emphasizes how we can make workplaces full stop, like from the moment you attend to kind of what you ask for in interviews, um, just everything within the workplace. It's no longer about whether you have a mental health issue that you need to disclose, but actually just how can we improve your work-life balance or how can we improve your work life? And I think there's a lot of great information within that um, within that website that I just, again, like I said, just can be translatable into potentially into design. Um, Trey, maybe you had a bit more focus on design. Well, it's, it's, those, are, those are great points. I, I would say this, you know, so Apple's done an excellent job of this. This is, this is one of the things I believe that they have superiority in. And what I mean by that is we've seen great things from Microsoft. We've seen amazing assistive technology, whether you're talking about a video game controller or just other things that be, you know, become a little more extensive as far as opportunity for those who would otherwise not be able to use, they've enabled right the, the opportunities. But Apple has taken into consideration cognitive overload. Right. And there's that understanding of whenever anxiety comes into, into play, when you're designing, you have to understand what is it that's causing people to be anxious when they are um, when they're interacting with something that you designed or something around that you're maybe doing usability testing on. Right. And as you look back, as you as you may take a step back, you may understand. And I had this experience, actually, we, we did some store research. I'll make this really quick. We did some store research. And we were implementing a new, a new product and we just got done designing it. And in that design path, we were going to test a couple of features. So we ran some scenarios. And in that, we actually found out that majority of our users who otherwise could not identify verbally why they were unable to navigate through the end to end scenario, it was actually based off of the reality that we had way too little white space in the, in the interface, right? We needed to have enough white space so that they could number one, um, follow with the eyeball, you know, uh, and, 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 and evaluate not too much reading. People don't like to read. I mean, you know, that's the truth on the interface. People don't like to have too much there. So there's a lot that you want to make sure there's clear and concise primary actions. You want to give them very easy and fluid approaches on how they are going to execute in a task and, and simplifying that by taking less in the screen, not hiding things, but putting less there and still making it available for them that's where I believe we get a lot of wins for those that may have anxiety as they're in, um, working on a, using an interface, sorry. Awesome, thank you. 
Yeah, I definitely agree. Like cognitive overload is real. It's like, look at like Google form versus type form. Like type form, it just like gives you like one question at a time versus Google form. It's like a lot of information. So things like that. I also really love the term neurodiversity. I've seen like kind of a movement of people kind of shifting a term like disability to like differently abled. So I've personally been trying to use more of these terms that are more inclusive and um, more like more, more wholesome, more inclusive like that as well. Um, there's a lot of great resources shared in the chat, so you should definitely check out all in the chat. And I've also shared Bronwyn's resource in the chat as well. And we have 29 questions. So uh, one of the uh, number three, the top question is, out of all the major tech companies, who do you think is doing the most accessible design and what can we learn from? So do you all have any examples of companies that are doing a great job or some resources to learn more about accessibility? That was also another question that was submitted on Luma. I have a, a few that I like. I think they're pretty standard um, out there, but um... IBM accessibility, I really like. Um, they have a really good breakdown of the accessibility guidelines um, between the different levels of the WCAG guidelines. They have examples, um, so they're awesome. Uh, I, another company that I really like is Microsoft, but they, again, they go from more in the inclusion um, direction, and that's because they've also got cat homes there, so um, or had cat homes with them. So there's some great, um, pieces of work being done from Microsoft around inclusion as well. Um, so they're like my top two with regards to companies. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I would agree. Um, I definitely think Ron was like 100% on the money. I would say uh, the only one I would add to that is, uh, I mean, there's, a, there's many to add actually, I can think of many, but I know that I just mentioned them before was Apple. If you've ever taken the time, if you have an Apple device and you've ever taken the time to look at the accessibility features, don't assume that it's not something that you may need to use. They are pretty, I mean, the haptics, I mean, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty phenomenal. There's a tap feature on the back of the phone where you can actually tap it to actually leverage certain, um, certain features and you can choose which feature you want to leverage. Um, so it's, it's, there's some amazing things that you would take for granted that we actually have at our fingertips. And uh, I think Apple's done a phenomenal, phenomenal job, especially over the past few years. Um, they have just, they have just to me uh, within their devices made some really great strides uh, at driving accessible and inclusive design. Yeah, definitely agree. Check out Apple. Anna or Trace, did you have anything else to add? Any resources to learn more about accessibility? Uh, one I'll chime in with, um, <clears throat> I know Microsoft was already mentioned, um, but what I'm really impressed with, and I'm a gamer, I feel like most people are gamers these days. Um, Microsoft recently released a, an uh, accessible game design and development set of uh, criteria. And I like, okay, I don't know how many of us are game designers here, but like what I love about it is like game design out of like can, has shown us that like you can go from pretty unaccessible to way more accessible, way quicker than people think. And like <clears throat> as a community, like uh, we've got, uh, the Last of Us. We've got Miles Morales. Uh, I, I can't remember uh, the Spider-Man video game. There's like a whole bunch of video games that are coming out that have higher levels of accessibility. And so, like, I'm throwing in Microsoft because like they have been working on creating guidelines for this, but also because I think what you can learn from that is, heck, if video game designers can do it, we can totally do it. Yeah, I love that. Looking at examples of Microsoft and games and their game design guidelines. That's super cool. I need to look that up too myself. Awesome. And for those of you who want to ask our speakers anything, come up on stage. Don't be afraid to raise your hand. We're not shy. We're really nice. Um, and with that, I'm going to keep going for the Slido questions because a lot of great questions submitted um, in the chat as well. And for those of you submitting questions in the chat, I've seen some really great questions in the chat. Please, please keep them on Slido so you can upvote. 
but I just saw a really great one from Jacqueline is what is your QA process for accessibility? I know Bronwyn asked that you shouldn't like think of it as a checklist. So I was wondering like, what are, what are all of y'all's, y'all's like QA process for that? If I could start this one. Um, I, so I actually, am going to say here, the Q, our hope is that by the time something reaches QA, that no surprises occur. And so this is, I mean, obviously this is high hoping, um, but the idea is we're trying to, at least on my team, and I, a lot of teams working towards higher levels of accessibility are working to shift that left. And so when something is in design, we're thinking about accessibility. When it's in development, we think about accessibility. Ideally, um, we're thinking about it before QA because it reduces costs exponentially. However, when it reaches QA, usually what we're recommending are a combination of automated and manual testing techniques. So using tools like Axe's, or sorry, DQ's Axe plugin um, to do automated testing in combination with you know, uh, any manual review that needs to occur. But most of the time, uh, we, you know, when we're trying to ensure that we're thinking about this holistically, uh, QA is aware of specific accessibility things to be keeping in mind and testing for. And ideally we've caught it before development, but that's not to say that they're not gonna have other accessibility issues pop up because no system's perfect, especially not uh, one that hasn't had accessibility baked in yet. But that's kind of my, my, my rant. I'll get off the podium here. No, I second that, Anna, and um, in Xero, it's um, part of our definition of done for our components within our design system. Um, so it has to fit inside the QA, but hopefully, you know, we've created design tickets or development tickets that are already thinking and considering, you know, what we need to consider from an accessibility implementation point of view. So, yeah, I, I agree that Hopefully, if you can, um, getting everyone to think about it um, from the offset is going to help. I did see one question pop up, which is if you can start it from the research. Yes, 100 percent. Start with a diverse user group that you're testing with. Find out, you know, even desk research, what the people are saying with a diverse um, opinion and views. So, yeah, all the way through. Yeah, one of the one of the things that um, and I, I love that Brownwood and also Anna, like you could have kept talking, you didn't have to come off the stage, you both could have kept going. It's good stuff. Um, the, the one thing that I think is, is directly impacting um, uh, from a day to day, I think uh, product partners as you're going and working with engineers, as you're working with product, uh, product managers or product owners or whomever, um, IOs, whoever you're working with on a daily basis. All from from where you are all the way up as you get into a lot of your uh, agile ceremonies a lot of the space that you get into you're looking to try to find ways to speak the same language because as we come in as ux you know designers or as accessibility designers there's a reality that we sometimes don't speak the language that comes across the board when we start talking about dubbing up stories right so there's the reality that we want to make sure that we're not iceboxing every accessibility impact and that we want to make sure that these things are sitting in the front of thought and not in the back of the mind of, you know, a way uh, to, to rot without, you know, consideration, as you may be the one person that's the, you know, the sounding board to say, we need to design for this, we need to build for this. Um, there's that buy in that has to happen. So before you start to really understand how to genuinely get it into production, right, how, how do you deploy this and bring this out to the world. That's something that I would I would highly recommend is that you have to have really strong buy-in. I think I mentioned it earlier is that trust is key. Those relationships that you work with across the board, you can only do so much, right? And we have a lot to do, but you can only do so much. And getting across the space, that's where I think the biggest wins can happen when you're talking specifically about how do you build a QA? Uh, um, what does what your QA environment look like? Or what does that look like when you get into uh, uh, prioritizing how to um, how to actually get across the WCAG standards. And I will actually admit here, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and admit, I have a checklist. I just don't rely on it. <laughs> so it's, 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 uh, it's something I, I, I definitely keep by me, but I, I don't, I don't live and breathe it because I understand that when you're doing the research and you're really testing with a, a diverse group of users, you start realizing, Oh, I can do that. So I'm going to get off the stage now. I'm done. <laughs>
Awesome. Thanks, y'all, for sharing. Um, we have about 12 minutes left. If you would like to come up on stage, I haven't seen anyone raise their hand yet, but do raise your hand or private chat me. Definitely want to give anyone an opportunity if you want to be on stage. We had so many great questions, but another great question by Jacqueline I saw in the chat, which kind of goes, um, brings in a theme of uh, taking account accessibility um, from the beginning is, what user research recruiting process is involved to ensure that the experience is designed with inclusiveness in mind? I can I can answer this. I just did a bunch of um, recruiting the other day. Uh, so I think it's it's important that the the sort of like baseline uh that you are the baseline types of people you're recruiting are diverse so like are they different ages are they in different places um and if you are making sure that you're not you know just talking to one type of person you're most likely going to include someone with a disability or someone that uses accessibility features um i have had to recruit specifically for people with um, certain learning disabilities on a past project that I've done. And it's it's hard, I think, for people with, it's certainly hard for me, but um, it's hard for people with disabilities to trust that they should sort of disclose this information to you. And they want to know why you maybe want to talk to them about deeply personal experiences that they go through. Um, when I have needed to talk to those types of people, I found a lot of success in joining um, Reddit groups that already are sort of a safe place for active discussion um, and starting to participate in that active discussion and forming connections sort of like in a social way and then asking people from those groups if they would be willing to do uh, like add, if they'd be willing for me to add them to my research list or something. Um, but I definitely think if you know if you just start asking random people if they'll talk to you about their disabilities or if you want to um, start including if you just sort of ask someone at the top of a interview about that you might not get sort of the um, information that you desire so you have to come at it from sort of a place of trust at the beginning. I think that's a really great point. I mean for so long, you know, people have been kind of afraid to be like, hey, I, I'm disabled. And like, it can be kind of scary to ask people that, especially in a situation where, you know, um, they're trying to, you know, they feel like they're being evaluated. And so it, it, I think one of the most, uh, I, I recently uh, saw, and like last week it came out, it was an inclusive design research group on, um, on Medium, and I'll put the link in the chat. Um, it, it's one of the places I feel like I need to grow as a designer is inclusion in research. Um, one thing I've heard other accessibility uh, advocates do, and ones with you know who I look up to and admire, um, is they'll you know establish disability ERGs and resource groups within the company, and then uh, pull from those groups to do testing and and uh, get feedback. And so it's kind of the hope is that, you know, you're kind of getting two benefits out of that, but also creating a place where, um, you know, disabled employees can be them they as they are and and then be seen as, you know, be, be seen as not just, you know, well, uh, uh, to be seen, really. And, and then to have the opportunity to get their feedback. Um, and part of the reason that some companies will do that versus, you know, say going out into the wild and asking people is, you know, some software and some products can't be tested with um, with just uh, B2C or uh, can't be tested without signing disclosures. And so um, so that is something that I've, I've heard has worked pretty well. Uh, and I know um, I know uh, a few folks who have used that strategy. Um, I was just going to add, actually, as well, and it kind of talks to your employee point, Anna, um, which is if you actually bring a diverse um, group earlier into the process, you might find that you actually get those that with disabilities or those um, that use um, accessibility features involved in the design process, helping with some of the 
um, ideas and um, you know, d designs as such, and they might be able to also reach out to their, or they might be more willing to reach out to their communities um, because they've actually got a stake in this design process. And obviously, as a result, you're also going to end up hopefully creating a better solution because you've involved them from, from the beginning. Yeah, I really like how Trace mentioned how taking account trust because in Reddit as a resource, I would have never thought of that before. I used to try to reach out to like Facebook groups and stuff, but Reddit is really a place where people are more anonymous, so they're more open to discussing and it all starts with trust. Um, and we have about four minutes left before our group photo. So I would love to end with a question in the chat that is also common in Slido is by Yoon June is, what do you see the future of accessibility going for products and what are you see the struggles upcoming? Um, I have I have like a radical hope for the future and it is that uh, legislation in digital product design becomes as sort of um, strict or uh, as a, uh, as valued as it does in architecture. Like I think in city planning or architecture, accessibility is very um, well documented, very well considered and very le like highly legally protected. And so I hope in the future that there is like a huge revolution where all the uh, every company we work for has to spend a lot of time making everything access as accessible as they can, even if it means, I don't know, global, economic disaster. I don't know. I mean, it won't mean that, but uh, I, I hope that it comes to a point where we all are forced to do it if we are not at doing it yet. Yeah, Trace, that was fun. That was good. That was good. Um, good points, man. Uh, I, I got to say this. Uh, one of the things that I've all, I always have, will have a hope for is that the challenges come down as far as the legal the lawsuits, that they come down that the laws may maintain, but that people don't have to rely on the laws to checkbox. That's what I'm hoping for, because that's where I think we're going to get our largest or more expansive approaches around having strong and effective and usable and impactful experiences for all people um, to make sure that we're considering um, the, the, the limitations of, of, of anybody that may go through anything that may be temporary, situational, or permanent, uh, that we would actually take the consideration from a from a company to company standpoint, that they would take accountability uh, and actually appreciate uh, every user as they are, as not looking at the majority or not looking at them from a you know a statistical perspective. Um, you know, a number that 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 really screams out at me, um, and I really wish that this was not the case. But this is where I hope we get away from that. Over twenty percent of lawsuits in twenty twenty were filed against a company that had already been sued at least once in the past two years. So if we can get that number down, if we could get more accountability, um, to Trace's point, getting people more central around the understanding of how can we start advocating and spend more time um, specific to things around accessibility and inclusivity, that would be a sweet world. But the struggles, are just that really. That's really what the struggles are. We're living in that space now currently because we're trying to get to that point. Um, amazing, Trey, like, such good points. Um, I just saw someone write in the channel, um, I want accessibility to be the new norm. Well, I actually, I think, want to flip that on its head a little bit and I want normal to be striped from our definition or from our vocab um, and a realization that actually no one is normal we are all unique we are all intersectional we are all very different and therefore you cannot design for an edge case because edge cases don't exist you can't design for the 80 percent because the 80 percent doesn't exist um so yeah that for me is like where i want to go a post-normal world these are amazing points and i will wrap uh if it's cool with y'all i'll wrap with uh, I don't expect in the future that everyone will become an accessibility specialist. But what I hope for is that everyone will become an accessibility advocate. 
if that means you walk into a situation and you don't know the answer, but you're still saying, what can we do better? That if everyone did that, we would go so much further. And that's what I hope the future looks like until we can at least get that at the baseline. Awesome. That was all amazing. I also love removing the word normal because we're all really unique in our own different ways and all have our own special strengths that contribute to the world. And we're going to take a group photo. So I'm going to count down for everyone to turn on their camera. Um, and yeah, and feel free to bring any plushie you want. We always do this at Design Buddies where we have plushies, toys, pets, uh, fun backgrounds. And so we'll be, oh, that's a banana cat. Um, we'll be doing a group photo and then a wave for our Instagram story where we just wave at each other and have a statement on story highlights. So if you, if you all want to be part of that, definitely turn your camera um, and you will be published on our social media as well. So just a disclaimer in case you don't want to turn your camera, but we will be sending out the recording to everybody afterwards. And right now it's an interview on our YouTube channel as well. And I'll count down 10 seconds and, and I'll take the photo. Um, please hold your smile because there are multiple pages. I want to try to get as many people as I can and make sure to connect with our speakers on ADP list if you want to schedule a mentorship session with them and connect with fellow buddies on our networking sheet that just, just shared in the chat. Um, all right, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Smile, stay smiling. And then I'm going to get the other pages, all of the pages. Awesome. We're going to wave now. If we can wave and dance and dab, this is for our story highlights. We always do this at every event uh, <laughs> just to like jazz it up a bit. So I'm opening up my phone right now. Oh my God, I see doggos. I see plants. I love your plants. I love your plushies. Definitely show them off and show us all what you all have. I love Design Buddy's Zoom background representation as well. All right, ready, set, wave. Hello, everybody. We are at Designing with Accessibility in Mind with ADP List with Bronwyn, Anna, Trey, and Trace. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Have a nice day. Awesome. This is going to be on Instagram story. So y'all just appeared on TV. Um, that concludes our event. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Make sure to check out Design Buddies, ADP List, connect with our speakers on ADP List, and um, schedule mentorship sessions with them if you all wish. And hope you all have a nice day. And thanks for joining us on this nice Tuesday or Wednesday evening, morning, or afternoon, wherever you are in the world. I see you're all from all over the world here. So thank you all for joining. And make sure to check out Design Buddies and ADP Lists events all coming up too very soon. And for the host, we're going to stay for really quick retrospectives and thank you. So I'm going to open a breakout room just for the host so there's nothing more um, as well. But I'm going to start streaming on YouTube.